amazingly, we serve the same God that is in the business of saving us. It doesn't matter how deep you have been. doesn't matter what you have done. We serve a God that is mighty to save. Amen? Um, I was telling a pastor just now that I, I think I ate too much. It don't look like it, but I... <laughs> But I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that we have this opportunity just to, I'm going to work it off. I'm going to preach it off. That's what I'm going to do. That's it. I'm going to preach it off. Uh, today we ended at the space and the place where the ark was being built. And so you may ask the question, well, how does prophecy play a part in the ark being built. It is important to know that in 1 Peter 3, verse 20, Peter is speaking to, I'm going to say this, to the new believers and also reminding, I want to say the old believers, that in the time of Christ's second coming, 1 Peter 3 verse 20, that it will mimic what the days of Noah was like. Now, now I want to share with you before we pray that the prophetic word is also the preached word. But it should be something that we're reading and studying that helps us to recognize that something, someone is soon to come. Amen? Prophecy is not given to us so that we will say that we know this more than the next. Prophecy is given to us so that we will recognize that the way the world is going and what is happening now must come to an end to something greater. Oh, man. And so as we bow our heads together, we open our hearts and our minds to be receptive only to the word, not to this pastor. Do you hear it just now? But to the word. Father, again, I ask that as we listen and as we discuss and as we speak from your word, that it will not be me speaking. It will be your Holy Spirit speaking through me. In Jesus' name, amen? Let's look at Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. We have now ended off in Genesis chapter 7 where the Bible clearly tells us that when it comes to the generations, when it comes to the generations, that each generation and every individual has an opportunity to be saved. I want to say it again, that in every generation, there has been given the opportunity to be saved, which means in this last generation, Everyone has the opportunity to be saved. And watch this, watch this, watch this. I don't care what you think about yourself. There are many of us who come to church feeling like because of our attendance record, let me say it again, because of our attendance record, I'm ready for heaven. I need you to know that your attendance record means nothing. Oh, boy. It means nothing concerning your saving grace. Your attendance to church or Sabbath school is only, watch this now, it is only a step up from your step in with Christ. Which means, which means, the reason why we come to church, the reason why we go to Sabbath school, the reason why we we still should accept Wednesday night prayer meeting or some midweek get together. Uh Uh-oh. Let me get a commercial real quick. Let me get a commercial. Um, At the, at a... This is recorded, right? (laughs) At one of the churches that I pastored, it is amazing how the pastor can be outvoted for something that's spiritual. I ain't scared of y'all. It was my custom growing up, growing up to have Wednesday night prayer meeting. Wednesday night prayer meeting, many people feel, many in this generation feel, even many pastors in this generation feel that it, it, it's not 
it, it doesn't work. And I want to be clear that the reason for Wednesday night prayer meeting is to, is to fuel you to get ready for the rest of the week. Oh, uh, man. You, you will find that many churches today, and I'm gonna, I can only speak for this area. In this area, many churches do not do Wednesday night prayer meetings anymore. They feel that it gets in the way of people's work schedules. It, it, they, they feel like this, we did church already. Well, we, we're okay on Wednesday. Let me be clear. Any midpoint that there's no boost leaves individuals, and I'm going to say this, leaves individuals weak for what's coming. So I was outvoted in my, in my church. I was outvoted that we're not going to have prayer meeting. And I was outvoted by elders. So I took my key and I said, because I'm the pastor here, right? You never should say I'm the pastor. You should be the pastor. Amen. That I took my key and I let the church know that on Wednesday, the church will be open for prayer meeting. The deacons don't need to be deployed. The, 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 I'm not going to say the, the ones who opens the doors don't need to be deployed. The pastor will open the door. I'll, I'll take off the alarm and we will have prayer meeting. I'm not being defiant. I think someone else was being defiant towards God. Because the truth of the matter is, is that many of us are not studying and not going into the word because we have taken these precious opportunities and leaving it to self. We're saying, I got this. I'm okay. I'm all right. In fact, with the pandemic, we have said, I can do church. But what I believe in the pandemic was that God has allowed us to firm up our relationship with him on a personal level. It didn't say that we don't need to be with the brethren anymore and that we don't need this gathering anymore. And so here it is that we have found, we have found that many people do feel that because I come here, I'm saved. No, we come here because we're saved. Oh, I'm in trouble. Did you know that you're saved already? The, su the Sunday folk got it right. The Sunday folk say, say, says, oh, I'm saved. And then when we hear individuals say, I'm getting back to this, when we hear individuals say, I'm saved, I I'm in the church, I'm saved. When we hear individuals say that, then we try to get theological with them. That how can you be saved? Christ is not here yet. Well, I want you to understand that 2,000 something years ago, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for the past, for the present, and for the future. It is up to us to accept what he did on the cross. Are you with me so far? So there's a level of acceptance. So when we say we are saved, it means that we have accepted what Christ has done. And if you accept him as your personal savior, watch this now, you are saved. The only way that you can be lost is if you unsave yourself. The choice to be lost is yours. <laughs> I didn't say the choice to be saved was yours. The choice to be saved was, was Christ's choice to save you. The choice to be lost is up to you. So now when we look at this, watch this, now when we look at this, it's important, especially as we go into next week, we find that even Jesus' death on the cross was a prophetic statement. It was, it was, it was time that passed that people recognized or wise men recognized that this Jesus that's supposed to die is supposed to die during this time. Can I get a commercial real quickly so you'll come back, so you'll come back. I want you to understand that Jesus dying on the cross, dying between two, two thieves, dying at the time of Passover, uh-oh, okay, uh, um, with, the, with, the, with, the, uh, um, with the veil being ripped from top, from top to bottom, not from bottom to top, shows us that in history we have found, in prophecy, we have found this Jesus in prophecy. The question is, now that he came, now that he died, 
now that he rose again, say with me, everyone, now that he rose again, now that he's in heaven interceding, does prophecy still make sense today? And the answer is yes. The Bible shows us, again, in Genesis chapter, one, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, unto whom, everybody? Come thou all thy house into the ark, for thee I have seen righteous before me in this generation. That's not, that's KJV? That's King James Version? Is it? Okay. Of every, listen everyone, in, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by how many? All right. By male and female and of beasts that are not clean, bring them in how? Two by two. Oh, have mercy. Now, I need you to understand this, right? Please, you may say, Pastor, why are you reading too much into this? But I need you to know that the clean animals went in by what? Right, the unclean went in by? That means the humans went in. Oh, oh, hold on a second. I, is everybody all right? I, I need you to know that every living creature that was saved, the unclean went in by twos and the clean went in by sevens. And there were eight people on the ark. Hey, come on now. Noah huh, and his wife, two. Come on, unclean. The next son went in unclean with his wife, unclean. And the next one went in unclean. The next one, eight of them went in unclean. I need you to know that Jesus is not trying to save clean people. He's trying to save unclean people who are willing to get into the ark. Somebody, anybody with me so far? You see, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the prophetic word says there's an open door that won't shut yet. And if the door is open, that every unclean person has the opportunity to get inside the ark. That's what we need to be preaching, Pastor. We need to preach that there's still time. The prophetic word tells us that soon there'll be no time. That's the scary part of the prophetic word. But the prophetic word, the saving grace of the prophetic word says there is still time. Now is the time. Now is the point in time for you to get in. Don't wait for the door to shut because you might be on the outside of that door. The Bible is clear. Watch this. The Bible is clear. If we keep looking in verse 3, it says that every beast, come on, everyone, Every beast, are we having, I got, oh, maybe I should put my glasses on. <laughs> right, here, here it is. Oh, of the fowls of the air, everything seven, four, verse four, for yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth, 40 days and 40 what? And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from the face of the earth. And verse five means everything. Verse 5 says, look at verse 5, Noah what? Wait a second, that's it. Who, wait, hold on. Man, I feel like I'm in a classroom. He obeyed. He did it without asking how. Okay, let's talk. We, we have a funny way of forgetting the Sabbath. The word of, listen, listen, everyone, the word of God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it what? Good. This is, the Sabbath is not a Jewish belief. God simply asked everyone to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Now, it may sound crazy because we say it all the time, right? But remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? Because six days you will labor and do everything you want to do. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Neither thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger. Anyone who comes in our house needs to know it's Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, listen, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he did what? He made it holy. He hallowed that day. He made it holy. What makes you and I think that because time has passed that this is not in, into play anymore? What, what makes us think? Listen, family. What makes us think that because we did it right before and it's old-fashioned that it's still not binding for us today? 
the, the issue with us is that we are not into obedience. We're into what we feel makes me feel good. Ah. Uh, I, I, I was talking to... <laughs> Let's talk to my daughter. Here we go. And some guy asked her, said, hey, listen, let's go out. This was last night. She, she says to me, hear me out. She says to me, Dad, I, I want to go with them, but I, I don't want to go with them. And, uh, it's Friday night. And the first thing I'm thinking of, she's debating? But I like what she said. She said, I'm, I'm not in the mood to go out anywhere. Okay, since you're not in the mood, she says, Dad, what kind of excuse can I use? I said, give him the best excuse. Because I know you weren't thinking of this excuse, but I'm going to give you one. Tell him it's Sabbath. And he can't tell you anything because he's also Adventist. Y'all ain't hear me. You see... The sad thing is when Adventists have forgotten and Adventists have forgotten because there's no one to hold anybody accountable. It's all about obedience to the word. It's about obedience to what God says. And Noah did this. He obeyed. He did this because God asked. That's it. It's simple. And sometimes I think that we as a church, can we talk for a minute? I think we as a church sometimes, we put too many clauses to obedience. If he said it, that's it. It's good enough. But some of us have been so, so much into the church that we now have questions and, and, and what have you. Man, please camera, if, if the camera could stay on me just for a moment. Can you stay on me just for a moment? I always have to say this at some of my churches because they like to move the camera around when I say this. Let me say this, especially, my, I, and I say this lovingly. One of my girlfriends is here, so I'm going to talk bad about her. Shh, just stay with me. Stay with me. I said, just, you know that's how what's the knee in point? All right, stay with me. <clears throat> there is, listen, family, because I don't want to leave a problem for your pastor. And for those who are watching online, I don't want to leave a problem for you either. But there is, listen, there is no sin in wearing jewelry. Please stay with me. Don't leave now. Don't cut off the, don't leave. Don't cut off the camera and run. The church has been teaching this thing so wrong that when people decide to make up their minds what they're going to do, we see it as sin instead of see it as study. So, so, so I'm, I'm saying this because so many doctrines have been passed over because we haven't taught it right. So that when people have uh, understood for themselves what they should do, then we say that they're going against the grain. But I want you to understand that there are certain rules and regulations that come from the word that should not, you cannot ask any questions about it. He said it, he means it, and that's it. Some of the things that we teach, we teach it as a club. And we need to be very careful. And what I mean by that is, and I'm not leaving a mess for your pastor. Don't try to debate me, you will lose. Okay, I'm talking about debating. But according to the word, what we should have been teaching people is that God believes in jewelry. That's what we should have been teaching. We also should be teaching that there was nothing wrong. Listen, there was nothing wrong with putting jewelry on back then. Everybody wore jewelry back then, and everyone drank. It's biblical. It's biblical. Everyone wore jewelry, and everyone drank. It's biblical. Let me say it again. You shouldn't have invited me. Everyone wore jewelry, and everyone drank. I can give you instances. You're going to lose. The issue simply is, is that what we should have been teaching people from the word was adornment. Are anybody with me so far? Because, because what has happened is that in adornment, there needs to be a dress code for Christians. And in, 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 and in adornment, God has asked us to be peculiar people. In being peculiar people, because the rest of the world was wearing jewelry, all right, we have decided as a church that we want to be peculiar. We have decided as a Seventh-day Adventist church, 
coming out of the Methodist movement that we want to be set aside. So we put in place that we ought not to wear jewelry. What we should have done was said that the reason why we also move away from jewelry is because of the origin of jewelry. I'm taking, I'm taking three more minutes with this. Because according to the word, according to the Bible, the Bible says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. If we taught it that it was gods, then we can stand, something, we can stand on something strong. But, but what we have done is cause people to be a part of the club and says, if you're going to be a part of the club, you can't wear pants, ladies. If you want to be a part of the club, you, you can't wear jewelry. If you want to be a part of the club and in the in crowd, you've got to be married. You single people mess things up. If you want to be a part of the crowd, you have to look a certain way. And I, I'm taking this time to say this, right? That at the end of the day, and, and I'm going to say this, I am not a proponent of jewelry in the church. Do you hear what I just said? I just think, listen, I just think I was at another church last week in New York, and I, sp I simply explained to them that one of the reasons why so many Adventists, especially in the Mecca of Adventism in this area, wear jewelry now is because no one stood firm on the why. According to the word, the Bible says that when the children of Israel left from uh, uh, 40 years of wandering, they went through, come on, they went through the Red Sea before, and then they went through where? Jordan. And when they went through Jordan, they followed the very ark, the presence of God. They said that no one, I mean, they were, they were safe because the ark stood firm. Those who held the ark stood firm. You hear what I just said? One of the reasons why so many teachings is coming into the church is because no one is standing firm. You want people in the seats, but you want no firm people in the, in the seats. You want a crowd, but you don't want people learning about certain things. Are oh, you understand where I'm coming from? It is time for the church that after this prophetic uh, 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 um, uh, 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 revival or after the teachings each Sabbath that we stand firm on what we learn. So just because you're homosexual and you come into the church, it doesn't mean that we don't like you or love you. We don't like what you do. Like you shouldn't like some of the things we do. So what I'm saying is that as long as the door is open, they got to be obedience getting, going in. Uh, oh, I, I, don't, I don't want you to miss the moment right now. Don't miss the moment that God is calling us to be obedient to everything. So that means, listen, so that means if, if I'm just saying, if you are wearing your jewelry, come on, your earrings, then I could wear my wedding band. You see, we compromise whatever we stand on. And to be totally transparent with each one of you, I wear mine, but not to church. I wear my, I, I wear my wedding band. I don't wear it here. You want to know I don't wear it here or when I preach? Because y'all are not, um, um, you, you all are not, y'all are too judgmental. I know this is recorded. I'm going to go right to the word. Right after this, I'm going to go straight to the word because I took some time with something. I need you to also, uh, listen, recognize that when, when I lost my job years ago as a pastor, 19 years ago, I lost my job as a pastor. Did you hear what I just said? No one tried to help me and my wife. They talked about me like a dog. I would never preach again. I would never pastor again. I would never do this or that again. I, I was so in the dumps because of how they treated me and how they looked at my wife. And one day, about seven years ago, seven years ago, my wife was walking in the mall, and she says to me, would you wear a band? I said, I don't wear a wedding band. I'm a pastor. She said, would you do it for me? And I thought, and I said, I wasn't doing it for the church that didn't do anything for me. So why don't I do this for her? The church allows it. So why don't I wear a band for her? Because she asked me. 
and we went to the store and we bought a band. I mean, it don't look like nothing, but it's a band. <laughs> but I told her that on Sabbath, when I come to church, I would not put it on. And she agreed. Just the same way, when my daughter decided to pierce her ears when she left home for school, because it couldn't happen in the house, she said to me, I followed all of your rules. Listen, she said, the reason why I didn't wear it, and I love her for this, the reason why I didn't go behind your back and pierce my ears or this, that, and the other is because you're a pastor and I did not want you to lose your influence. She said, but I'm a woman now. This is between me and God. But I kept, I kept what you asked me to do because I didn't want to lose your influence. Our church today is losing influence because we don't have obedient people in the church anymore. The church is losing, uh, 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 um, uh, losing influence because we're not preaching the prophetic word anymore. And the prophetic word helps us to make the decisions we need to make. Are you with me, everyone? As a whole, it helps us to make the decision. So now, listen, so now where are we going? Now Noah is asked by God to bring your family in the ark. He's asked by God to do this, and he obeys. The first thing he does is he builds an ark. He builds it to specification, and now he says, I need your family to go into the ark, but I'm not going to ask you. Listen, family, I'm not going to ask you to, uh, to go into the ark. I'm not going to ask you to be saved without obedience, and I'm also not going to ask you to be saved without giving you a sign that something is about to happen. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. The Bible tells us in, in, in Genesis chapter 7, it says, and, and Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah, verse 7, and Noah went in. Come on, did you just hear that? And Noah went in and his sons and his wives and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the flood of, of the waters. But of every clean beast and of beasts that are not clean and foul and everything that creepeth upon the earth, they went in, into and two, unto Noah into the ark, male and female, as God commanded who? God commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood was upon the earth. I want you to understand they came into the ark before it rained. We know it was seven days, but he doesn't know it's seven days. He doesn't know when. All he knows is to get into the ark. Don't build it. Listen, don't build it and be lost. Don't build this thing and be lost. Don't be members of a true church and be lost. Don't be a part of this great movement and be lost. Noah still had to get inside, and the first people he had to preach to was his family. Get inside of the ark, and when he gets inside the ark, they wait seven days. But what's so beautiful about this is that the ark door was open. Uh, the Bible says, allow them to come in. Noah didn't go out and bring people in. That wasn't his job. Noah left the door open, preached the message, and everyone did not accept. Everyone did not accept, but the animals did. I want you to look at this. I want you to think, I want you to think this thing through. Think this thing through. Family, I want you to know that according to the word, not spirit of prophecy, okay? Come on. Not spirit of prophecy. Not Ellen White. Uh, not Ellen White. I want you to know what the Bible says. The Bible says that the, the clean animals went in. Sevens. They went in. Uh, now, now, if you want to look at the spirit of prophecy, it says that an unseen hand brought them in. But if I was making jokes at, at, at good Noah and I saw seven giraffes and I saw, I'm just telling you, right? And I saw seven, no, 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 not seven giraffes, two giraffes, seven sheep, seven goats, thank God for goats. Two monkeys. <laughs> hey, I need you to know that if, if I saw that from the outside, looking in, the door is open and all of the wrong individuals are going in. I would have said, listen, I don't believe. <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe. No, I don't believe. 
But if these animals are going in, in sequence, then I'm, a, I'm going in too with the monkeys. And, and when you look at it, I don't want you to look at it just to look at it that way because after Noah preached, listen, after Noah preached, then God had to send the signs. You see, if you're not on point with prophecy, you won't know the signs. When, when our dear Obama signed into law men and women getting married, this is what was happening in Noah's day. When the Bible says they were marrying and given into marriage, it was same-sex marriage. It wasn't just marrying who they wanted to marry. They married anybody that they chose. This is the kind of behavior that was going on. Every I imagination was happening, come on, continually that was evil. Are you telling me that with the devices we have today, huh, with the openness we have today, we are open to more things than they were before, yet, yet, our minds to do evil continually, we see it on the news. We see it in our movies. We see it in books. We see it in education. We see it in the churches. It's just pure evil. You're telling me that Peter was wrong when he says that the, the end days is going to be like the days of Noah? He's correct. And so when you look at 1 Peter uh, 3 verse 20, if you want to know what the last days are going to be like, the prophetic word says, look at the days of Noah, and it's happening even now. So when we look at this, we find that, that, that there is something happening. What's happening is that the door is open, and while the door is open, the Bible says that Noah does not shut the door. He does not have the authority to close the door. The only one with authority to close the door is God himself. And I thank God that he's the one that shuts the door. You know, I know some people that if I was God, I'd shut the door on some folk. I'm, don't even call it hate, right? It's just that if I'm in heaven, I don't want you to be there. Oh, no, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, right, that this is one of the reasons why we got to get it right with each other. Because if you don't get it right with each other, you be the one gossiping at the tree of life. And if you're gossiping at the tree of life, then you are, that's sin, am I correct? And you're an insurance policy. You, 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 you are a hazard. Because he says that sin will not arise a second time. So if you go to heaven hating someone, you're going to bring that hate to heaven. You don't change your mindset going to heaven when we're all changing a twinkling of an eye. It's only our bodies that are changed, not our mindset. It's our mindset that says, I can't wait to see Jesus. It's our mindset here on earth that says, if I'm going to see Jesus, I got to love my neighbor. Mm. I got to like you. <laughs> I got to like you. It's, it's tough. Because... Because if someone got into the ark that did not like one of Noah's sons, there would have been a problem. But the fact of the matter is that because the door was open, listen, because the door was open, it meant if animals can go in, then what about humans? God is calling each one of us to recognize that the open door theory is given to each one of us so that we can get in. Now is the time. Now is the opportunity. I mean, now is the time and now is the opportunity. And so here it is. We find that when you look at uh, 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 the door being shut, it reminds me of Daniel chapter 12. Can we go to D Daniel chapter 12 for a moment? Because this is where the prophetic word comes into play. The Bible tells us in Daniel chapter 12 that with all the mess that's going on in this world, all the tyranny that's going on in this world, the political strife that's going on in this world, the Bible says, and at that time, and at what time, everybody? That time. It's so, listen, it's so beautiful to know that that time ain't happened yet because we still got time. I'm thanking God that we still have time. But what time are we talking about? The Bible tells us, at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince will stand it for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of what, everybody? Trouble such as never seen 
uh, since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in, everyone that shall be found written, everyone that shall be found written in the, come on, everybody, in the book. Is your name written there? Oh, oh y'all don't know that hymn? Come on now. Here it is. The Bible is clearly showing us that the reason why we're going through what we're going through right now in this world is so that we can see that there's no other way but Jesus. There is no other way but Jesus. The Bible says that at that time, what time are we talking about? We're talking about a time when people do what they feel like doing. They do what they want to do. Laws are being changed so that people could be free to do what they want to do. Now, now, even though there is a candidate that said that they will try to abolish abortion, that's just one thing that I agree with. But I don't agree that we should be able to tell people what to do. Are, are you on, just stay with me. I don't agree. You, know, you can't get up and tell people what to do. Let me tell you, and let me tell you why that is so intricate to the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the teachings of prophecy. Whenever you tell people what to do personally, it's called the blue law. Y'all shouldn't invite me. If, if, you, if you notice, listen, family, if you notice, all of years ago, they, we used to put all of our trash in the same bin. We don't do that anymore. We separate them. The government is telling you that you need to separate your garbage. The government is telling you that you need to put it in the blue bin. Anytime you see blue, it's a, that a blue law is put into effect, a blue law changes your behavior. It changes the things that you do. Please, let me give you an example. In New Jersey, there's a blue law that says you cannot, all right, you ready for this? You cannot water your lawn on a Sunday. There's a blue law. I give you the greatest blue law. Now that Sunday morning is coming, you can't buy liquor here. You can't, you can't buy liquor on a Sunday here. Or oh, some of y'all are saying, well, I don't know because I don't buy liquor. It's a blue law. There are laws that are into play that you don't even realize that they're, they, that they're playing with your decision to do something. So the, so the blue law or that time that we're talking about is a time where the word of God tells us, listen, where the word of God tells us that these powers, these heads are looking to change times and laws. And when, it change, when you change times and laws, it can change the very thing that you do. One of the laws we believe and still believe, but we don't preach it enough anymore, is that someone is going to tell you that there's no longer a day of prayer, but now there's a day of worship. Well, there's a Trump Bible. There's a Trump Bible. Oh. Oh, you didn't know that there was a Trump Bible? He's trying to sell a Trump. He's trying to sell a Bible. It's, it's called a Trump Bible. I, I, I want you to understand that he's not who I'm afraid of. It's when Congress comes together and agrees. And I'm saying this to you because the door, while the door is still open, watch this now. While the door is still open, there are certain things that are happening around us to help us to realize that he who say he will come shall come. The second coming of Christ is soon. It is so, listen, it is so soon that everything we see around us should let us know that something is about to give. When an atheist can say something is about to give, something is about to give. And so we find in Genesis 7 that there's an open door theory, but then we find in Daniel that when all of these things are happening, when, when people are are being round up and put in concentration camps. It's immigrants today. It may be religious people later. And, and mind you, you can replay this over and over again. I'm not talking about one leader as a candidate. I'm not talking about one leader. Stop. I'm not talking about Mr. Trump. I'm talking about anyone 
that is in that place that allows me, we're gonna, we're gonna, I'm setting you up to go somewhere, that allows the beast to control them. Once you're controlled by the beast, anything is possible. So I'm, I'm sharing this with you because God remembered Noah and every living individual that was inside of the ark. And, and as he remembered each one of them, the, uh, um, every animal, every individual that was in there, it was important to realize that, that they spent in the ark over a year waiting. But there's always a time of preparation. The Bible tells us, listen closely, the Bible tells us it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights. Anytime you look in the Bible and you see the word 40, it's a time of preparation. Anytime. Anywhere you look in the Bible, 40, you find that the children of Israel were lost <laughs> 40 years. It was a time of preparation. Jesus, before he was tempted by the devil, fasted 40 days. Huh? Every time you see 40, and now this reset is about to happen. In this resetting that's about to happen, the Bible tells us that it rains 40 days and 40 nights. It cleans out every living creature. Every living creature is gone. And some people may say to me, well, Pastor, I think that's a fairy tale. You're telling me this world started over with eight people? Well, you believe it started with two. I'm talking about Christian people. Christian people are saying, really, really? Will God really start the earth over with eight people? Well, that's more believable than two. And so here we find that his reset, the reset is about every individual recognizing that you have a chance to heed to obedience. You have that opportunity to heed to obedience. But here's the problem. It's my problem, and it's also your problem. This thing called sin is real. Come on. This thing called sin is real. And what's amazing to me is that the sin that so easily besets you is not the same that, that, that so easily beset me. This thing called sin catches us so differently. You know, the only scary thing about the church is that the church only deals with one sin. That's it. Sexual sins. That's it. There's nothing else. There's no other sin. But there's so, there's so much sin. According to the spirit of prophecy, uh-oh, already? According to the spirit of prophecy, in fact, your manual, your manual tells you that there's so many different infractions that can cause a person not to be a part of the group anymore. Now, first of all, I'm going to say this, and I don't want to get fired. No, it's not. I need money. Um, somebody's been there, done that. Um, nowhere in the manual should it state the word disfellowship. Never. It's not a biblical word. It's not in the Bible. Are you, are you understand? I mean, I can tell you instances in the Bible where we as pastors, I'm going to share this with you. We as pastors, we can have an infraction, an infraction, not even sleep with anybody, an infraction. And because of our moral uh, mindset leading to our jobs, we're gone. That's it. But David still be, stays a king. David killed somebody and still stayed a king. He impregnated somebody and took the wife, and he's still king. Because God said, he, he's, because God said that he was a man after his own heart. You know what that means? That means he didn't do the same sin over and over again. He repented. So you're telling me that if someone should, I was in a meeting, I was in a meeting sometime. Listen, I was in a meeting. And in this meeting, the question was asked, if, this, if a pastor messed up, Come on, just messed up. What would you do? And I said, I'd have to find out how we do, how do we redeem the pastor? And they were like, well, the pastor can get baptized. Baptized, baptized is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I need you to listen because there's going to be people coming into this church that you've got to realize that they don't need the baptism you do. It says there's one Lord, one faith, one what? One baptism. Listen, listen closely. It is important to know that we have to stop baptizing people like it's an initiation process. God is not interested in wet people. He's interested in obedience. 
So when I said to them, well, listen, we bring the people together. Let's see if we can redeem not only his life, but redeem his work. Oh, I don't think we can do that. No? No? You don't, you don't think God is greater than that? You don't think God is amazing? When someone comes to me and they say to me, Pastor, I've, I've messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm messed up. I, my money, listen, my money is gone because I, I, um, I gambled it away. Gamble? I said, man, I wish I had that problem. Gamble. Another brother come to me, man, I had an argument with my wife, man, I, and, I, and, I, and I hit her, and she, she you know, I, I hit her, I hit my wife. And I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, some of us don't realize that, that there's not only one sin in the church. There's pride in the church. There are individuals that can't work with one another. Did you know that according to the book, man, I, I wish it was all Adventists in here. Do you know, do you know that according to the, the book, um, evangelism, that when the church comes together to plan evangelism and someone decides that it's not going to work, they are filled with demons? Come on. These are the last days where there'll be shaking up in the church. The Bible talks about a shaking. And the reason why I'm going into all of these details with you is because when we start looking at, when we start looking tomorrow at the, at the, um, uh, um, um, at the head of gold, when we start looking at the dates that was put to it, when we look at what was, is happening in history, we'll find out that Jesus is soon to come. We're no longer living in the times of the feet. We're no longer living in the time of the toes. We're now living in the time of the toenails. But the door is open. Stay with me now. But the door is open. Uh, I don't want to take too long, but the door is open. And with the door being open, everyone has the opportunity of going into this door. Everyone has the opportunity of passing the threshold. And, and this is what I love. I, I love this because there's so many individuals that must realize that you stink like everybody else. Huh? All the right that you do is like filthy rags. So, so the reason why the door is open, because they know that now that you come into side, now that you come in inside of the church, now that you come in inside of the ark, the ark, listen, the ark, even though it has the very presence of Jesus, it still carries your stench. Come on, come on, family. Huh? It still carries your stench. So, so, so because you're standing before God doesn't make you clean. Standing before God, is the, he's the one that's clean. He just covers you. Let's pause and just say amen for that. Huh? So here it is, according to this word, the prophetic word now. Let's go back to the prophetic word. The prophetic word tells us, Peter tells us that the same days of Noah, what's happening in Noah's time is going to be happening now. So then, so then it's time to study what's happening in Noah's time. It's time to study what's going on. No one's believing anymore. Everyone's, every, remember, everyone was spiritual before. No one is spiritual anymore. No one is praying anymore. No one, I, mean, every, I mean, the church is satanic at this point. Everybody's doing things evil continually until Jesus says, enough is enough. The same Jesus that said enough is enough is the same Jesus that will stand up and say enough is enough. You see, one of the reasons why we don't want to talk about this because we want more people in our church. But the truth of the matter is that when you come into the church, you have to expect persecution. Persecution from folks on the outside and persecution from folks on the inside. That time, when we talk about that time, we're going to talk about Jacob's time of trouble and the time of trouble. We don't talk about these things anymore, but the Bible says there's going to be a time of trouble that we have not seen before Jesus comes back. And that time simply is now. It's now. And, and some of you are waiting for something else. What you're waiting for, watch this, what you're waiting for is the Sunday blue law to come before you get it together. I'm going to say something, and I want us to be friends, and I want to stay Adventist. <clears throat> you have scared us. And if you're a visitor, I am not frightening you to be a Sabbath keeper and to know that that there is this last uh, threshold that a time is going to change and Sunday's, I mean, Sunday will be that new day. And by that time, when they sign that into law, there'll be no more, uh, you know, that's the sign. That's it. Oh, 
I don't know, I don't know where we get that from. Don't be upset with me. Don't be upset. Many of us teach. Listen, many of us teach that once that Sunday blue law is passed, then, then at that point in time, the, the ceiling begins. Well, let me be clear. My dad is dealing with some level of dementia right now. When my dad, he says, boy, I'm, wow, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Just three weeks. When my dad uh, comes before a, a hospice and my dad makes a statement, oh, what a bold man, and says, don't, don't try to work on me if anything should happen. Don't try to work on me. I've done my three score and 10 and more. Oh, I'm, I'm 54. I can't talk like that. You can't save me. What I'm telling you right now, I can't talk like that. I'm, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. I love God. I can't talk like that. I'm not ready. When I say I'm not ready, right, I'm telling you right now, when I say I'm not ready, right, some of you are saying, my God, you're talking to us and you're not ready? I'm, I'm trying to tell you that what my father said, I don't think I can say that right now. It has nothing to do with me not wanting to get to heaven or putting away sin. It means, man, there's some stuff I want to do. I can remember, listen, I can remember, and I know, folks, I'm, I'm talking a little bit more than what was in the notes, but I, want, I need you to understand that I can remember being 18 and saying, God, don't come yet, I need to be married. And I remember getting married, and I'm saying, Lord, I need some children. Don't come yet. And then when the children came, I said, Lord, don't come yet. I want the house to be paid off. And, Lord, I don't, I don't need you to come yet because I need to retire. Next year is my retirement year. Next year is my retirement year. I mean, I look like it. Have mercy, but I'm on Next year is my retirement year. And I, and I want you to understand, I'm going to always, Paul Graham is going to always put off Jesus coming. When I hear my dad, he said, I've lived my 10 my, my, my three score and 10, plus more. I said, man, I want to get to a place where I can say I'm 54, and if you choose to take me today, I'm ready. Come for me. But I'm not, I'm not there yet because I like computers. I like cars that still run by itself. I'm into Teslas. I'm into homes. I'm into traveling. I like to go to Jamaica and sit on the beach. I like Bermuda. I like all these places. And Paul Graham's issue is that I am, I am weighing heaven, which I've never seen, to an earth that I like to have a good time in. And prophecy tells me to get out of that mindset. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you. Get out of that mindset. Because you might wait to get married and that person will lead you to hell. You might get that house and you're working until you're working on Sabbath. Come on, somebody. You may want all these things. And yet he's saying that I have an open door. And the open door policy is anyone can come in. Because when Noah went inside of the ark and his three sons and their wives, the word said, and he shut them in. Oh, my, I want to live my life. I said, I want to live my life when I'm walking shut in. When I'm responding shut in. When, when things happen in my life, I, I don't lose it because I'm shut in. Huh? Come on. Because, because once we're shut in, it doesn't mean that we're stuck. It means that we're safe. The prophetic word teaches us that if we heed in obedience, we will not just be saved, but we'll be safe. I believe there's somebody here, somebody watching right now that wants to be safe. And being safe, you have to probably put away some things, put away some folks, put away some stuff you like to watch, put away the mundane thinking that this world is going to last always but recognize that one day, because we're not going back to this again, one day, 
the window was open. And the bird came back. <laughs> First the raven, then the dove. Raven, then the dove came back and said, you can come out now. But I don't want to come back out to the same world. I want to be reset. Because when the future comes, I want to be ready. What about you? I'm so sorry, Pastor. I left the notes, man. But the door is open. God is calling us to come inside to a stink place, but it's safe. Father, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to clean us and prepare us and to ready us to get inside of the ark. Peter reminds us that if we want to know what the future is going to be like, let's look at the past. And if you prevailed then, you'll prevail now. There's somebody here struggling in a sin. Somebody here struggling with an issue. Somebody struggling really with belief. I'm asking for a double portion of your Holy Spirit to fall on us, that we will become a ready people so that we will not be missing from that great number. Reset us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.